So once again, yes, my name is Miha. Uh, welcome here. I'm glad so many of you are here. A bit louder, Say again. A bit louder, please. All right. Uh, maybe someone can help us uh, with incre by increasing volume of the speakers. Uh, if not, I will try to speak up loud. All right. No, no, this is good. I hope that you can hear me now a bit better. So again, I, I can see quite a few of you joined. I know that uh, the reason for being here with me now is that you wanted to secure your place for the next speaker in the front row. So and <laughs> the, uh, the only thing that stands between the next speaker and, and yourself is me. So I'll try to get myself out of your way quickly. But um, I will do uh, some video uh, casting here. I have captured a number of uh, movies, short movies, uh, that will help you understand how Erlang clusters work how message passing in those clusters can work. This will be the view. So a few words about myself. Uh, I have graduated from the AGH University of uh, uh, Science in Krakow some few years ago. Um, I'm a technical lead of one of the Erlang Solutions offices, which is in Krakow, Poland. Uh, I'm also a Manguzayem developer. This is a product, open source product, that the team in Krakow is responsible for. Uh, and a few years ago, in Stockholm, during the Erlang User Conference, I had a chance to present uh, a proof of concept. It was a lightning talk. So the proof of concept looked like this. It was uh, a graphical user interface that was rendering uh, in a browser on a WebGL canvas some 3D uh, well, hmm, visualization of processes and messages being sent between them. So this was just a lightning talk, uh, not really useful. I was trying to be funny, so I handed in something like 400 3D glasses to people sitting there, and people actually could put it on, uh, which, which they did. Uh, and then the whole audience was actually watching those videos that were presented in 3D. Uh, this was just trying to get an idea whether this is something that community would be interested in? Is this something that people would find intuitive to navigate? So this was just a, a proof of concept. And then for quite a few years, I've been looking for the right tooling to improve on this visualization. And then a few months ago, I came across a component that Netflix has released as open source. They call it V0. If you have attended a talk by Casey a few minutes ago, he has demoed this tool. When I saw the animation that can be rendered with this tool, I felt like this is really exactly what I was looking for. This can be used not only for what Netflix has there, which is hundreds of microservices running on several Amazon regions, but it actually could be used to represent our Erlang or Elixir distributed systems. So we decided to give it a try. Uh, last year, late last year, we implemented another proof of concept uh, and now what we do here is we have Elixir getting started application from the Elixir language website which does implement the key value storage but you have a hash function on the key so those values are stored in two different nodes depending on what is the hash. And what this visualization will do now is you will see traffic coming from the internet where people are trying to store keys in the database and because of these two nodes, which are here, across which we distribute the keys, you will see that the traffic will be evenly load, well, load balanced between the two nodes. So I had just started the demo application. Requests are hitting one of the nodes. The hashing function is distributing keys across two nodes. And this has been demoed in December during uh, Elixir conference in Warsaw, Poland. Again, I was just trying to understand whether this would be of interest to the community. We got quite some good feedback after the conference, so we felt like this is really something we need to... Uh, uh, I have to ask, what is the meaning of the speed of these dots? All right, uh, so the question is, what is the meaning of the speed of these dots? Each dot represents a single um, message sent from one Erlang node to another. The speed doesn't really uh, say much other than the density of this part, those particles is updated every five seconds. So for five seconds we observe how many messages were 
sent between two mm -hmm. nodes, and then we update the producer of this particle system with, with the volume that it's, at which it speeds out uh, particles. It's one dimensional graph, and this is just uh, animation. Right? It's an animation, but so depending. The don't, don't mean anything, right? Density of this animation represents how intensive the traffic is. So the more particles you see, the more interesting traffic, the more intensive traffic we get. So the only dimension is number of dots. There's nothing else, right? You will see in the next few examples what we can represent with different graphical features of the animation, all right? OK, so, so this was sort of the preparations for the talk when I was thinking of what, what to talk about. And the, the agenda for today will be I will share some design principles behind the tool. Uh, what is already available, this is an open source project, so s some features have been already implemented and you can get them. Uh, how it works inside, so what, what is the, the uh, idea behind um, the scenes. Some ideas for future work. And I will also be happy to answer any other questions. So the design principles here. First, it has to be intuitive. So the idea here is not to uh, add tens of wiki pages which will explain to you how you are supposed to use this tool, but this should be intuitive. You should open a browser, you should see the user interface rendered, and it should be intuitive how to navigate it. Also, visualizations should, after a few minutes at most, be easy to comprehend. This is the, one of the design principles I would like to embrace. Second is that all of this is based on Erlang tracing. Erlang tracing can uh, be used to capture a lot of different events in the system. And the more events you have, the more complex it gets. Those co sets of events can be really complex. And how to navigate, how to reason about them, how to analyze them, this is, this is quite a challenge if you have many trace events. So the, the, the design principle here is to simplify those sets. So say you have a thousand events that tell you that a message has been sent between two processes. We want to simplify it just with, for example, a count. So how many of those messages were? Not really what were, was sent, but how many? And by simplifying the set just to an, the size of the set, it can already give quite nice feedback to the user and yet make it easier to comprehend. Then another design principle is that we don't worry about production systems. So although it would be of interest to see how a production system behaves, this is not the, the principle here. The, we want to make it work for developers who are iterating on their software design and they need to understand what they have done, what just happened, <laughs> what was just committed. And of course, it would be nice to have it run on the production system, but we will not guarantee that it is safe to do so. So we don't worry about production systems. And also, I mean, the tool that I showed before was uh, developed four years ago. At the time, only a few browsers had good support for WebGL canvases. Nowadays, every browser has reasonably good WebGL support. So we want to leverage this and really do a lot in WebGL. So most of the visualizations that you see today have been rendered with WebGL engine on the WebGL canvas. So what is available? So first of all, this is a tool. This is really a developer's tool. You can download it on the website, or you can check out um, the repo and build it. And it builds to, to a command line tool. So you can run it and discover what it can do for you. For example, it can uh, tell you what are the arguments that you can pass to this command line tool. Arguments being the, the node you want to monitor, cookie that you want to use to connect to that monitor node. You can add paths to plugins and a few other things that you can pass as arguments. So having look, have a look at this, we realize that the way to attach us to a node is to provide a node name. We will also add some extra logging here to better understand what has happened. So we run the command. And we see that plugins were started. We have plugin for dashboard, for ST, for version, and for traffic. We don't know much about it yet. 
but the tool says to navigate to the local host on port 8000. So this is what happens when you navigate to this um, port. It's, uh, this, this page actually has been implemented in the Elm programming language. For those of you who are familiar with this language, um, maybe you already like it, maybe you don't. For those of you who are not, Elm is now uh, getting quite a lot of interest. I'm not sure how many companies have been using it successfully in production systems, but it generates a lot of interest. And this was also one of the ideas behind implementing an Elm view, is to try to get some feedback from this community and maybe they will be able to contribute new plugins. It's not that you have to develop views in Elm, but we do support Elm as one of the front-end programming languages. So what Elm does here, for example, it connects to the back-end and gets the version of the tool and then renders here in the view. So very simple, but uh, just illustration on how you could use Elm language. Then another view which is already available is just like very, very basic information about your system, nothing interesting. What is more interesting is the dashboard. And here, the unique selling point of this dashboard is that it has seven metrics. Seven. I repeat, seven. This is quite a few, isn't it? Handful of metrics. And it has three, literally three charts. <laughs> right? And those metrics are throughput, so like the number of messages and bytes that are being sent through the system, number of processes that are currently running in the system, number of spawns that happened in the last five seconds, as, as well as exits and abnormal exits. So this is how it looks like. So now we will just play some animation when Manesia is executing transactions, all right? So first we observe the system, not much is happening. There is something like 33 messages flying through the system every five seconds. You can see this dashboard here. A throughput is measured <coughs> on the timeline. In other words, those 65, 65 messages, 30 messages, they just fly through the system. But now we will start executing some Manesia transaction. And of course, number of messages flying through the system increases. So now we are processing something like 3,000 messages per five seconds. And this is also visualized in the graph so you get some context. So you get some historical context. How was it a few minutes ago? How is it now? You, you can spot a trend if you like. So nothing fancy, but it gives you a very, very first impression on what the system does. Is it really busy? Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's just doing nothing, really idling. This one is now quite busy as it executes the Nisha transactions. And we can very easily spot it by looking at the graphs. Right. Now, next thing to do, now that we realize that there is something going on, would be to navigate to, the, to, to this tab. So we navigate to this tab, and this one will draw a graph representing a supervision tree. So supervision tree view uh, supports some um, hide and show applications. So Erlang releases consist of several applications, typically. You may want to render just some of them, some others you want to hide. You can zoom, zoom in the tree so that you basically see in more detail certain branches. Uh, you can also zoom out. And then you can also click and get some more information about certain worker or uh, supervisor. So this is how it works. We have now enabled this, this view uh, of supervision trees. And there are two applications running. One of them is kernel. The other one is Mnesia. You can see them rendered here. Supervisors are green, workers are blue. When you click on the process, those squares represent processes. You can see there's many process info rendered on the right-hand side. For example, here we clicked some process, and it happened to be Mnesia Locker process. You can tell by looking at the registered name attribute from the process info function. So you, we can now try to uh, do another Process info, this is Mnesia Transaction Manager, Mnesia TM process, which is connected here. So let's see wh what happens when we kill that process. So we now call the exit beef, and we're going to kill that process, Mnesia Transaction Manager. Let's see what happens. Application shut down, it says, and so it disappeared. All right, so this was quite 
crucial process for that application because it didn't really restart it. We now need to restart it manually. So this whole supervision tree of Nisha has spawned again, and we can see it being rendered here, and the force layout is trying to make this uh, graph look nice and, and readable. So this view will help you explore your supervision tree and also try to understand which workers are doing what. All right, so we move on. Now we will present another view which is already available. That's the view of the cluster traffic. So distributed systems consist of more than one node. Erlang nodes connect with each other over so-called distributed Erlang protocol, and they can send messages between processes sitting on different machines. And it would be interesting for us to understand how many messages are being sent between the node that we observe and other nodes in the cluster, so that we better understand if there are any bottlenecks, if, well, like, is it the input or output traffic which is uh, high and so on. So things like this would be nice to understand. For example, for years I've been wondering what are the differences between Minisia dirty write, Minisia sync write, and Minisia transaction, right? People will tell you that the transaction is more expensive because it has to do some distributed log, while dirty write is asynchronous, whatever that means, which means that it's cheaper, they say. So things like this have been on the mailing list for years. I've been reading about them. I'm a technical lead of, a of my team, so I'm supposed to read those mails. But how do you know that those guys who post those messages on the mailing list say true? <laughs> so I, it was always interesting to understand how that works. And let's try to find out. Because in this cluster traffic view, you will see the number of Erlang distributed messages being passed between the node you observe and other nodes. You will be able to understand the ratio between ingress and egress traffic, so input-output traffic, as well as the distribution of load across the nodes. So we start with uh, eight nodes. So we have a Minisia cluster, which runs on eight Erlang nodes, all connected together. The central one that you can see here represents the node that we are observing. Uh, so you also see this uh, here. A at 127 and so on. So the name of the node that we observe is also, this is the node, and the ones around them is, is node uh, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right? What we will do now is we will, on this node, execute Minisia transaction function uh, 2,000 times, all right? So we will see what happens. And also, just to make it even more interesting, Soon after, we will execute the same number of transactions, but originating from node B. All right, so this is node B, this is node A. Let's see what happens. First, we start with node A. All right, let's see. Right, so this is 6,000 messages per five minutes. Oh, 11,000, this is quite a lot. There is a lot of traffic which is now within this cluster. 11,500 requests. Now we also started this other one from node B, and you can see that this node generates 25% of the overall traffic. The other nodes generate 12, 12, 12, and so on. So it's, it is evenly distributed across the nodes that just receive right operations from the central node, but this guy, because it also executes some transactions, is responsible for generating twice as much traffic as the ones that are just receiving. So it sounds about right, and I think those guys who were posting some, uh, well, information about how Nisha transaction works were quite about right. This visualization proves this. But this is just transaction. We can now also see other animations. Uh, this one will show us how sync dirty behaves. So now let's have a look. Again, the same idea. We will be executing 2,000 sync dirty operations from node A and from node B, and we will see what happens. So again, similar pattern. However, here, there's half the traffic that was on the previous slide, right? We have 11,000 before, now we have 5,000. So this is less expensive, at least traffic-wise, compared to the transaction uh, that was run previously. As far as the load balancing is concerned, it's, this one also is generating 25% of the traffic, and the others are responsible for the rest. So same pattern, if you like, as far as the load balancing goes, but in terms of number of messages, we actually generated half the traffic compared to the previous 
operation. And then we have another one, which is uh, dirty write. And this one, again, we will be executing it first from the central node. There is even less operations now. We can see something like 3,000. And you can see that the color of those is only blue, meaning we don't actually receive any messages back. We just send them out. This is truly asynchronous, and we don't receive them back. The only node which sends us something back, and sending back is represented by yellow dots, is the one from which we are also executing asynchronous write operations. So it works both ways. So it makes sense, and it actually indeed proved, visually at least, not mathematically, but visually, that asynchronous operations take place when you execute dirty write. OK. So what's, what's next? Next is also mm, message passing. So once you have observed how a cluster behaves and what are the traffic patterns in a cluster, you may be interested in understanding the um, patterns of message passing inside a node, right? So we already have that implemented as well. Uh, we will use, again, Netflix visualization for, for this, but we will dive into one of those nodes. So again, we are executing Nizhia transaction, but we want to understand what is happening inside an Erlang node. So we start with this global view of the cluster. You have seen this presentation already, so nothing new here. And you can see that the density has increased. Now we click on the middle node, we dive in, and now we will be observing what, what's going on in there. So this is not rendering nicely yet. Uh, this is something we need to fix. So it takes a bit of time to actually manually do the graph layout. I hope that we will be able to add like force layout or something which will be more automated, not, not manual. But still, as this animation is going, what we can see is that there are some processes which are very busy. There is the Mnesia transaction manager. There is the um, few other processes here that we can see PIDs of. There is Mnesia locker here as well. And you can see which direction those messages are passing, right? Here, this is both directions. Here is just one direction. Here is also one direction. By density of those particles, you can tell also how expensive or how intensive this, application, this communication is. Because other nodes, other processes, don't send that much between each other. Those are only the one, two, three, four, five processes that are very active when Nija executes transactions. So it's, it's helpful because now you actually understand where are possible bottlenecks, right? You, you easily spot the processes which are really busy with message processing, and those are probably the ones that you should look at first when you want to maybe look for bottlenecks or understand better what's going on and who, who is really responsible for, for the load of the system. So how this works uh, behind the scenes? It's quite simple. It actually consists only of, of uh, one fun, one function, which we spawn remotely. Uh, there is just a hack here which allows us to uh, spawn the fun on any node, no matter what is the Erlang runtime system version on the remote node, because it can happen that uh, the version of the runtime system on which you compile the tool is different from the one on which you want to run the application that you observe. And in order to be able to spawn functions remotely, we are actually doing all the scanning, parsing, and compilation through the RPC call, so that later we can spawn link this remote fun on the remote node. So this is really uh, all it does. It spawns one fun and is running one process on the target node. And that process, what it does, it, it turns on tracing for all processes for flags like send, receive, uh, process-related events, and it will always uh, stamp them with a timestamp. So this is exactly the reason why I do not recommend running this on the production system. Because what we say here is we want to process all your processes and actually want to process, uh, trace all send and received 
messages by all of your processes. That, in some cases, can be a lot of traffic. You have seen the animation with uh, Nizia on eight nodes, and it was something like 11,000 messages per five seconds. So what are the ideas for future? There are a few that I listed here, but I will be very interested to talk to those of you who find this useful on what are the views that you might need. And I would be very happy to try to work on those views as well. So one idea is to hook this tool, which helps us observe a system, to a continuous load testing. So what's continuous load testing? Uh, I take it that most of you have heard the term continuous integration, and tools like Travis continuous integration, which works perfectly fine with GitHub, is, is a tool that you have the chance to use, or at least you, you have heard of. This is a dashboard of a Travis uh, for Mangus IM project on GitHub. All, all it does, it just executes all the integration tests every time you commit uh, some increment of code or uh, send a pull request. So the same idea is with load testing. For every pull request, we would like to execute a bunch of load testing. We came up with a tool called the Murder of Crows, and what it does when you st start it is it attacks <laughs> your system, right? This is how you can visualize what the AMOC, in, for short, does with your system. And we developed a tool that does continuous load testing the same way as Travis does continuous integration, we call it Tide, so Tide plus AMOC, uh, and also instrumented with a Docker Swarm, which we used to set up the environment, the test environment, uh, gave us an opportunity to implement continuous load testing concept. So we spawned cluster of Mangus IM nodes of AMOC load generation tools, and this is similar to typical Travis continuous integration workflow and we get a dashboard. But this time we don't show how many tests have failed, but instead we show metrics that were captured during load testing. And you can compare and contrast different metrics uh, between different pull requests as you move on with your development. So what would be nice is now not only to capture those metrics, which you can easily draw with tools like Grafana, but also to observe the node during load testing with those visualizations and also be able to compare and contrast how certain pull requests affect the behavior of the traffic of the, of the no distributed system. Another idea is uh, continuous chaos, which uh, for those of you who were present at the talk by Casey Rosenthal before coffee break, he was talking about continuous chaos at Netflix. Uh, he introduced us to the concept of Chaos Monkey. Netflix runs Chaos Monkey on live systems. And he claimed that it helped increase service availability because when you run this on a production system, engineers tend to implement fallbacks, which will protect the system from any Chaos Monkey effects. So this is good. And this would be actually uh, something that we should do when we design fault-tolerant Erlang or Elixir systems. We should also keep in mind that we need fallbacks. Shall something go wrong, we need to have a fallback to, uh, to make the system fault tolerant. But how do you measure whether your design is already fault tolerant? It's not easy. You do it through some experimentation, but quite often you actually find out about flaws in your fault tolerance design on the production system. So if we, we could use this visualization during Chaos Monkey experimentation on a, on a system, not necessarily live system, I think it would help us understand whether the system is already designed in a way which helps it survive certain crashes. Another idea that comes to mind, how this tool could be extended, is with the beam modeling language. So, although the tool is called Erlang Performance Lab, and you can derive from the name that it is supposed to help you find bottlenecks and increase overall performance. Actually, going forward, I'm thinking of it as a, as a tool for developers. In other words, that we should help you not only find bottlenecks and understand the behavior of your system, 
but also help you communicate what is it that you actually have designed. And for this, I believe we should have a universal language, visual language, which will describe semantics of a system. If I'm an Erlang developer, somebody's an Elixir developer, and we want to talk to each other, showing him or her my Erlang code will not do any good. In the same way, when him or her would show me some Elixir code, I will not necessarily be able to follow what's going on and what are the semantics of the system. If we could have some modeling language, like the UML in the object-oriented programming, to show properties of the system, maybe this would facilitate the design and also discussion between different engineers. Actually, this concept is not, not, is not new. Torben Hoffman has came up with what he used to call visual Erlang, and I put here on the slide some examples from his visual Erlang notation. So for example, you could represent that one node observes the other, monitors the other through uh, such visual um, shapes. Uh, here you would represent two processes being linked, uh, that one process spawns another, or a message is being sent from one process to another. So I'm thinking that if we could use the WebGL canvas to draw some of those visual language properties, uh, maybe it would help us uh, translate semantics of a system to a slightly more formal description, <coughs> like in here. There are some other ideas as well. Um, there is already a waiting uh, pull request with timeline tracking, where you actually capture changes of your gen server state over the time, and then you can understand how certain messages that the gen server had to process um, changed the internal state of the gen server. So it could be interesting to actually be able to go back and forth on the timeline and see how the state was evolving as the gen server was receiving messages. So this is one of the ideas. And again, this is an open source project. It's a, there is an open source community. We have two people contributing. Uh, me my, and I'm also contributing to this project. Uh, we have quite skilled uh, front-end engineer as well as Elixir engineer. But if you would like to add new views or share some ideas, I would very much encourage you to join us. Those are some links that you can visit. There is a website where we publish our build, uh, our releases. Uh, there is a GitHub organization, Erlang Lab. We also try to tweet now and then on the Erlang Lab handle uh, with news or, or scheduled releases. Right. So to recap, this is an attempt to improve tooling for Erlang and Elixir developers so that we as engineers who are responsible for designing the system and different aspects of the system, being performance, scalability, fault tolerance, we need to have tools that will help us through that process. And this is an attempt to improve this tooling. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Otherwise, I will be also available uh, during the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, have you considered uh, depicting the supervisor trees as trees, so that you can actually see the relationship between the children, which is started first and which is started last. Right. Instead of a circle. No, I mean, it would be interesting to find some good um, visual properties, which would help us indicate on the picture, in the picture, uh, this extra properties that you described. Now we just used colors to distinguish between supervisors and workers, but we could use other properties like an orbit, like the size of a shape, like some extra text or things like this to tell a better, more detailed story about what's, what you are looking at. So this is interesting. Um, it would require some, some brainstorming. Uh, what, what visual properties are available and useful? Right, because my follow-up question then, of course, also be that 
Many times in the supervision tree you had uh, several reincarnation of the same child. So because if the work goes away, it is restarted and you want to see if you're actually looking at the same reincarnation or if you're looking at the successor of it. Uh -huh. So in other words, we are trying to think of a way to visualize response of workers, right? Yep, it's, it's interesting. I would say it's a research, uh, <laughs> but I haven't done that research yet. So, uh, yep, very interesting concept to, to think about. Thanks. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what needs to be done or improved in order to make this um, production system uh, applicable or safe? So I think that this is a question to um, the airline VM engineers, and there are a few sitting here. There is one who has implemented a new backend for the tracer in airline uh, runtime system 19, where the overall performance of, of tracing engine has improved dramatically compared to 18. Uh, so the question is, what else needs to be taken into consideration when you do tracing on live system? Uh, one idea I would like to explore is try to use the LTTNG backend for capturing and, ge and uh, generating traces. So instead of using the Erlang native tracer, which is built into the VM, try to leverage the LTTNG, en LTTNG engine, which uh, is operating on the Linux kernel level, and it's already available in Erlang 19. Uh, what is the difference between the overhead of one and the other? I don't know, but uh, this would be my first step. Try to understand, can we be, do it cheaper if we would use LTTNG engine instead of the native Erlang tracer? And then I would take it from there, depending on how low tests behave and how the system is responsive or unresponsive under some uh, low tests, I would be able to tell you more precisely under, until what mm, load this is safe, right? Beyond certain load, it is unsafe because of blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is definitely of interest, uh, but we are not there yet. <coughs> Anyone else? I actually have a question myself. Yes. Um, have you tried to use this as a teaching tool with people who are learning Elixir Erlang? Um, I would love to, because this is, I, I was teaching Erlang for the last six years or so, and it's always a, a, a challenge to explain to students uh, how this works, what has happened, and we try to use, uh, well, pencils and whiteboards, and we do a lot of brainstorming during classes, but tools like this should also help understand the behavior by visualizing those things r live, right, on a live system. So I, I didn't have a chance to teach any classes since this was developed, and uh, really this tool has been developed over the last uh, one, two months, uh, but I will give it a try and I'll share experiences. Thanks. All right, uh, then we Sure, any more questions? Last chance? Okay, well, thank you, Mika, round of applause. Thank you.